Hello, I'm Harley Schlanger from the Schiller Institute. Welcome to this week's Schiller Institute International webcast featuring our president and founder, Helga Zeppler-Rusch. Uh, there's been an incredible density of events over these last days, both with the motion toward the new paradigm and the new Silk Road, but also another one of the string of provocations, uh, war provocations, this one coming from uh, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu with threats to Iran. Helga, why don't we start there? Because this is an extremely dangerous development, what, what Netanyahu did. Well, I think it's quite significant that even a German uh, politician, uh, Mr. Röttgen, who is otherwise quite a hawk, uh, accused um, Netanyahu of having committed a conscious uh, fraud and effort to to you know fool uh, <clears throat> to fool the international community by claiming that Iran uh, would still be involved in a secret nuclear agreement. Now, in the meantime, the International Energy Agency, Atomic Energy Agency, has come out and said that there is absolutely no truth to it. That they conducted ten different reports that Iran is fully compliant with the uh, Iran agreement on uh, nuclear nuclear uh, weapons and that there is absolutely uh, nothing new in the material presented. Now, this was said even by a whole series of uh, former security officials from Israel it's itself. Uh, so the question is, what is the purpose of this, uh, which is clearly uh, a provocation and you know there were these missile attacks in Syria uh, where you know it's not yet entirely clear where they came from but you know it, it's not to be excluded that they did come from from Israel and obviously uh, you know Netanyahu is uh, having now a bill in the Knesset uh, which in the first reading got an absolute majority which would empower Netanyahu to go to war uh, there is opposition in the Knesset uh, against that uh, because the term extreme circumstances, uh, quote, is not specified uh, and therefore it's a sort of carte blanche, uh, you know, because you can always declare extraordinary circumstances. So this is very, very dangerous. Uh, this is obviously uh, a power game, uh, not really uh, regarding the Middle East as such. Naturally, Iran is the... Uh, thorn uh, in the flesh of uh, <clears throat> of uh, Netanyahu, but uh, I think the only way to look at the situation is that the Middle East is once again uh, the theater for a proxy war, uh, where the real issue is uh, the confrontation with Russia and China, because uh, rather than get, getting caught up in every single provocation, I would really encourage you, our viewers. Uh, to think about the strategic la long arch, uh, arc of, of developments. Uh, I could take it back all the way to the collapse of the Soviet Union, but let's start with the election victory of President Trump, who in the election campaign had promised that he would improve the relationship with Russia. And then subsequently, uh, he did not stay with the anti-China line, which he had in the election campaign, but started to develop a very good relationship with Xi Jinping, with China. And that from the standpoint of the geopolitical faction of the Western world, uh, basically situated in the city of London uh, and their junior partner in the Wall Street, uh, this idea that you would have a good understanding between the United States president and the governments of Russia and China is a nightmare because it would absolutely eliminate the possibility of their divide and conquer and playing geopolitical games. So I would say the origin of all of these developments, starting with the Russia gate against Trump, which is now completely out of the window because there was no Russia gate, uh, then going to uh, at the point when, when the British origin was in the center of attention in the Congress in various investigative committees. Uh, you know, they looked at the role of the British British collusion, uh, you know, in the coup attempt against Trump. Then you had the Skripal affair, uh, which, by the way, you know, now has completely uh, died out. It has disappeared from the British media as the foreign uh, 
Foreign uh, Ministry spokeswoman Sakharova pointed out uh, yesterday that there is no more mention about the Skripal affair in, in the British media. Uh, then when that fell apart, you had the so-called chemical attack uh, with chemical weapons um, <clears throat> by the Assad government, which then turned out it didn't even take place. It was a complete smokescreen by the British controlled uh, white helmet organization. When that fall, fell apart, now you have the <clears throat> supposed uh, uh, <clears throat> Iranian nuclear program, which, which also is a fraud. So there is a, a, and then you have the naturally the developments in Ukraine where Poroshenko uh, yesterday announced a military solution for the liberation of the Donbass. And there you have the same uh, group of uh, organizations involved, which we have pinned down and, and published uh, in the past many times. So the whole thing is really one long arc aimed at the containment of Russia, uh, the containment of China. And it is quite interesting that uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov just gave a long, very important interview to the Italian uh, media. Uh, where he said that every time President Trump has an impulse to improve the relationship uh, with Russia, the Russophobia mafia inside the United States is creating some kind of a provocation again, and that many of the problems in the world uh, remain unresolved because they would require a positive cooperation between the United States and Russia. So. I think that people have to really understand all of these things, why they have some merit in themselves, some logic, some historical or ethnic uh, ca causality. They are nevertheless being played on the big chess board uh, in the larger game, uh, the containment of Russia and China. And that obviously is an impossibility. And therefore, you have these um, tensions and, and very dangerous uh, developments almost on a daily basis. Well, I think that review is very useful for people because you can look at each individual event, but the connection is what's important. And of course, it's broader than just a, a regional war in the Middle East. If something happens uh, against the Iranian agreement, that'll have an implication for what otherwise looks so positive in terms of the Korean situation, doesn't it? Oh, yes. <clears throat> uh, I think that the uh, North Korea, South Korea, uh, process is one of the most um, uh, joyful things which uh, are happening right now. Um, many of the details are not so known, so let me just mention that in the meeting between Ko Ko Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in, uh, the latter, uh, the South Korean president, brought a brochure and also gave uh, <clears throat> a memory stick uh, to Kim Jong-un with a full-fledged development plan for North Korea, which uh, apparently involves, among other things, uh, two railway lines to be built in at the southern and northern co coast of North Korea, uh, connecting both with the ancient uh, Silk Road, but also uh, with the uh, Trans-Siberian Railway uh, through Russia. Uh, so this is very positive, um, you know, um, that there has been a CIA team in North Korea for a week inspecting various sites and Bolton uh, basically commented and says these are all good uh, signs of goodwill. Also that three Americans were released by North Korea. President Trump has uh, expressed his uh, uh, looking forward to meet uh, Kim Jong-un very soon. Uh, Kim Jong-un, on the other side, wants to meet also Abe, and President Moon of South Korea offered to broker such a meeting. Uh, so I think all of these develop, and then Wang Yi naturally uh, is today in, in North Korea. So I think these are all uh, very, very good uh, developments because, you know, if the North Korean uh, situation comes towards a peace treaty and, you know, <clears throat> potential unification under you, you, uh, Korean sovereignty, this would be a very, very important uh, milestone for all of humanity. But naturally, uh, the, as you say, there is a, a danger because Netanyahu, among other 
reasons, you know, namely that he wants to push Iranian influence out of Syria, timed his uh, statement, obviously, with the deadline of May 12th, which is when the decision in the United States will be taken to either renegotiate or <clears throat> cancel the Iranian uh, nuclear agreement or, uh, or prolong it. And obviously, Netanyahu wanted to create a hype so that the United States would, would uh, you know, insist on renegotiation, which from the standpoint of the Iranians is a cancellation and would throw the whole situation immediately into a very dangerous destabilization and may actually lead to the desire of the Iranians to then scrap the whole deal and, and go back to building nuclear weapons. Now, obviously, if that happens, uh, this could have the danger of threatening the North Korean situation because, you know, remember that Kim Jong-un went into this um, absolute intense nuclear testing, missile testing, because he looked at the Middle East and came to the conclusion that the only way how he can prevent that to him would happen, what happened to Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi would be that uh, North Korea is a full-fledged nuclear power and therefore there would be, uh, uh, you know, basically a defense against such things. Now, if he would think that it doesn't matter, even if you have an agreement with the United States, they can throw it out at the next occasion. Uh, I think this is a very, very dangerous thing. So I hope that President Trump is not overlooking that because, you know, I think that there is very clearly an effort to play on that, to also ruin the North Korea, South Korea agreement again. So these things hang all together. And I can only say, you know, I mean, the International Energy uh, Atomic Agency did say that there is absolute compliance on the side of Iran. Even Mogherini, the foreign minister of the European Union, uh, basically reiterated that and said the International Atomic Energy Agency is the only institution which should be consulted so concerning these questions. And if there are problems, they should be brought to them because they are equipped to deal with it and not some wild independent action. So I think this is the uh, field of tension in which all of this is taking place. And there's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy here that the neoconservatives play on, which is that once you cut off negotiations and diplomatic discussion, you create what they call a rogue state. And they say the rogue state is dangerous because it doesn't adhere to principles, when in fact, the West is the one forcing the, the uh, uh, fear, the, the producing the fear that leads to backing away and developing weapons. Now, I think this is also important in, in the broader context where you've been pointing out the importance of the meeting between Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping of uh, China. Uh, this has extraordinary implications, not just for those two countries, but going into another part of the Mideast where there's been wars, namely Afghanistan. So what, what can you tell us about the progress on, on that front? Well, I think this is really, um, I don't know, maybe as important as the Korea development because, you know, there was the effort to play India uh, in the so-called Indo-Pacific combination, meaning Japan, Australia, New Zealand, India, uh, against the new Silk Road and against China. And for historical reasons, uh, there is a strong British geopolitical influence in parts of the establishment in India, which uh, has been success susceptible, and it was played upon by the neocons and the British uh, to say India is the largest democracy, therefore they don't believe to communist China, they believe to the Western world, and, you know, that we should uh, work uh, with them. Uh, and, you know, in a certain sense, it looked for a while as if this would function, but after the uh, border incident in Doklam, uh, where basically, you know, I think both countries realized how devastating it would be for the two largest countries in the world if they would get into a, again, into some kind of a military conflict, there obviously was a rethinking uh, in India where um, most, uh, you know, people around Modi uh, are now moving in the direction of working with China. 
Now, that does not yet mean that India is supporting the new Silk Road because the, the issue of Pakistan uh, you know, is really a sticky one for, for India. And China is building this very important economic corridor, uh, basically from China to the, to the Gulf Coast of, of Pakistan, which India is completely objecting to. And therefore, at the SCO meeting, the Indian foreign minister did not sign the new Silk Road uh, resolution. Uh, but they now work together on the China-Nepal-India corridor, which is also part of the <clears throat> part of the uh, new Silk Road in reality. And therefore, you know, now you had this meeting in Wuhan and the two presidents uh, had six discussions over two days. And, you know, just to realize that India and China are not only the two population richest countries, they have together 2.6 billion people. That's 40% of the entire human population of the, of the world. But they also have uh, the two largest continuous cultures, more than 5,000 years old, who have over the course of universal history co contributed an enormous amount of knowledge, of poetry, of art, uh, and you know, are both sort of cradles of, of, the, of the human civilization. Now, what is very exciting is that they agreed in this context to have a joint development uh, between India and China in Afghanistan. They will build a railroad from Afghanistan to Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Iran, China, and you know, therefore tie Afghanistan into the Belt and Road Initiative, which is obviously very important for Afghanistan. The uh, president of Afghanistan had uh, requested several months ago that uh, the only way to solve Afghanistan problems would be as part of the new Silk Road. But it also is a way of bridging, so to speak, the India-Pakistan conflict, because uh, there are obviously close relations between Afghanistan and Pakistan. China has a better relationship to Pakistan. Uh, and if they now develop Afghanistan together, it sort of uh, you know, touches on this higher level of reason what, you know, we always have said, the New Silk Road uh, establishes, that you need a concept where everybody benefits, where you have a higher level of cooperation, which is capable of overcoming ethnical and historical and other conflicts. So if India and China can work together in Afghanistan for the improvement of the situation there, and this is a typical example of how the new Silk Road is also a peace, uh, <clears throat> a peace initiative, uh, which can solve all kinds of problems. So I think this is a very, very good development also. Well, and the, the Pentagon just released a report on Afghanistan, which said after 16 years, the situation is worse with the continuous war and the US deployment, the NATO deployment. And so this, this is the only alternative. Now, that just brings up to me a very important point. Uh, we've just been reviewing the in the last couple of days the role that your husband has played in bringing forward this idea of the four powers. And it's interesting, his, his first formu actual formulation of the idea of a four power agreement, Russia, India, China, and the United States, was in December 2008, right after the crash in September 2008. And Helga, I know you've been to India, you've been to China repeatedly, um, you're now seeing this this potential becoming real. Yeah, I think it's really uh, very good because I remember when my husband, Lyndon LaRouche, first said these uh, ideas like a four power agreement. You know, everybody was um, quite, uh, you know, full of disbelief. How could this ever be? Uh, but Lynn at that point uh, said that given the fact that we are dealing with a, an empire, you know, which you, we say the British Empire, which historically uh, is uh, correct, because as you know, my husband also has developed many times this empire, the idea that there is an empire with an oligarchical elite ruling over a preferably backward mass of people is uh, not something new. It's something which goes way back uh, even, you know, to the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, 
then it moved to Venice, then it moved to the Dutch British. And in a certain sense, it's like a, a, a chameleon, you know, it, it remains the same or a slime uh, mushroom, uh, which, which remains the same in character, but the colors are different. So people nowadays say, oh, the British Empire no longer exists. But if you look at it from the standpoint of the geopolitical politics of the uh, financial architecture which rules the world, which tried in the past to keep parts of the developing sector backward and underdeveloped, and which, you know, basically, especially in the last uh, 20 years, made sure that the rich would become more rich and the middle class would die out, the poor would become poorer. You can see clearly that this is an empire in a modern form. And it's quite powerful. It used the IMF, it used the World Bank, it kept the development of the third world down. And only after China emerged and offered cheap credit and actually donations and infrastructure that this dynamic started to change. But my husband basically at that time said that given the fact that this financial oligarchy is really running so much of the world, and if you look the private security uh, services, you know, which are sort of a modern mercenaries uh, def defending this uh, financial structure, uh, then he said that you need the four most powerful sovereign nation states of the world to ally together to defeat it. Uh, as I said, people were full of disbelief when he said it, but if you look at it now, Russia and China have a strategic partnership which is absolutely solid and I think there to be forever. I don't think it will ever go away. Uh, then with the recent development uh, between, Russia, uh, between um, China and India, uh, India is moving closer. India has a very good relationship to Russia anyway. And with the potential of President Trump, uh, you know, despite this present trade uh, <clears throat> negotiations, uh, he's, he just put out a tweet saying that he looks forward to see President Xi Jinping in the near future and that he always will remain his, his friend. Uh, and, you know, also the perspective of an early meeting between Trump and Putin. I think we are very close to this combination where, you know, we could really move the world in a completely different way uh, in a new paradigm where geopolitics stops. I mean, in any case, let me just say this because, you know, I mean, it's obvious that behind all of these affairs which we uh, named, the uh, Russia Gate, the Skripal case, the chemical weapons, now the Netanyahu case, uh, is obviously an effort to keep the status quo, to prevent the emergence of China as the rising power, and you know to basically keep the illusion that you can contain or regime change Russia. But I mean, anybody who thinks that you can keep the status quo when the whole world is already moving in the direction of cooperation, win-win, uh, working together, uh, that this is just completely impossible. So I think the West or those people in the West who, who are pushing these uh, provocations and also ordinary citizens, you know, you should think, can you imagine how the future should look like, let's say in 10, 20 years from now? Either we have World War III or had it already, or we will move into a completely new set of relations among nations where, you know, basically the common interest, uh, or as Xi Jinping always calls it, the shared community for the future of humanity comes first and then after that, you have national interest. So I think, you know, it is a, an existential question for humanity that more and more people start to think, you know, how should the world look like in 10 years, in 20 years? And if you are of the opinion that we must develop a new phase of the, in the evolution of mankind where we stop geopolitics, we stop war uh, and have a new paradigm, you should become active. You should join the Schiller Institute because we are trying to cause such a change in the thinking of the people and we need many people uh, to help us in this effort. So I'm really appealing to you, join the Schiller Institute 
and work with us because the potential has never been so big to move to a much, much, much more beautiful period in the human history. And we've been talking about the four power proposal of your husband, Lyndon LaRouche. He also has the four basic laws which uh, address the economic crisis. Uh, people should not take their eye off the economy. There are some new reports coming out. Uh, former FDIC Chairman Thomas Honig, uh, Sheila Baer, uh, very prominent in, in her fight against derivatives. And now Nomi Prinz has a new book out. Obviously, Helga, you, you ignore this financial uh, side of things uh, to your own detriment, because this is a, a crucial aspect of the strategic situation. Well, I, I think we have mentioned this already in this uh, <clears throat> webcast, but I, I want to say it again, uh, because, you know, Nomi Prince has this book out, Collusion, How the Central Bankers Rigged the World. Uh, where I have not read the book yet, but I got an initial report about it, where she describes how the quantitative easing of the central banks uh, to the advantage of the speculators in the last 10 years has created a situation where we are in a bubble of 40% worse than uh, in 2008, which could explode at any moment. Now, uh, we have talked to some well-placed people in the financial community who are quite worried um, that what could happen and and I think people should take this warning very seriously, that if the proponents of the old collapsing financial uh, Western system realize that this is end game, that they can't really prevent this from happening, that China is rising, that the other countries are rising uh, with China, that they may actually deliberately trigger a financial crash to pull the rug out from uh, underneath President Trump destabilize him, blame him in order to bring the neocons back uh, into power in Washington. So I think, you know, that is for sure one of the biggest uh, hidden dangers. Uh, and therefore, the only solution how you can prevent that is the immediate implementation of Glass Steagall, uh, but also, uh, you know, the whole package of Linz for Laws, the National Bank in the tradition of Alexander Hamilton, a credit system, uh, a crash program to increase the productivity of the production and the labor force for fusion, for space cooperation, but then also join the new Silk Road, uh, join the Belt and Road Initiative and participate with China in the buildup of infrastructure in the United States, have joint ventures in third countries. You need the full package. Only Class Eagle is not enough. We need the absolute return to a sound financial and economic system based on the tradition of Alexander Hamilton. And, you know, whenever that was applied, like in the post-war reconstruction of Germany, you had economic miracles, and this can be replicated any time. So I would again urge you, you know, I mean, this is, this is the Damocles sword, which is hanging over the world. So join our efforts to have a global class steagall because we don't need speculation. If we put all our resources into real production, productive jobs, education, you know, there is so many important things to be done that everybody can have a benefit. And I don't think we need mega billionaires because, you know, I think people should have a decent income, but they shouldn't be excessively rich and, and the majority of the people poor. And we, we really need to change that. Well, especially when they become rich by creating things that nobody needs. Now, just to, to conclude, I, I think it's important to give people a sense of the, the broader scope of what's happening around the New Silk Road. I mean, we're almost the only ones who are reporting on some of these things, but maybe you have something you'd like to add. The developments now from the Dominican Republic uh, on top of what Panama is doing. So that's in our own hemisphere in the, in the West. Uh, Peru has just uh, moved ahead with some agreements with China. And now Portugal uh, with the Maritime Silk Road. Uh, the, the Chinese are, are definitely on the move. And so what do you have from the U.S. Congress? The senator from Florida, who Donald Trump calls little Marco Rubio, threw a fit 
saying that China is about to take over the Western Hemisphere. So uh, and instead of embracing these initiatives, you, you see the hysteria. But I, I think, Helga, it's important for you just to emphasize the, the scope of this development, how it, it is, as you've said, it's unstoppable. Yes, I'm very convinced that this genie is out of the bottle not to return because it is simply, you know, appealing to the best inspiration and aspiration of the people. Um, you know, I think if you look at the world map, um, the, the majority of the countries are already on board. Uh, that's why I think it's unstoppable. And if you look at Europe, for example, um, it's uh, Eastern and Central European countries who are working with the Silk Road, the Balkan countries, Italy, Spain, Portugal, all want to be hubs of development, not only on the Eurasian connections, but also to the uh, Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. Then Switzerland is on board and Austria, which is, uh, you know, the new government uh, has adopted uh, a clause uh, to cooperate strategically with the new Silk Road. And now they announced that they want to take leadership in Europe to bring the Euro European Union in connection uh, with the Chinese new Silk Road. And, you know, even Holland and Belgium, the Scandinavian countries. So if you look at the map, uh, it is really uh, the, the, the m minority of countries which is not part of it. That's why I'm absolutely optimistic that if you help us to spread the news about that there is a new era of civilization, which is not based on war, subversion, regime change, coups, but to the advantage of the other in the spirit of the peace of Westphalia, I think the spirit of the Silk Road is contagious and it will catch on. So help us to spread this word. And one of the ways you can help us is go on the Schiller Institute, the new, new Paradigm Schiller Institute website, and we should have there a box for people to sign up to become members at whatever monthly uh, rate you can afford. But this is the, the most important organization in the world right now, informing people about these developments. And as Helga keeps emphasizing, we need your support. We need your involvement. So go there and sign up and, and become a part of this. So Helga, is there anything else you wanted to cover today? Well, I think people should should really have the sense that, you know, we are on the verge of a new hot war, and I would not underestimate that danger. I mean, the Ukrainian development is extremely dangerous. If there's a war between Israel and Iran, it does have the potential to immediately escalate. So don't be complacent. But on the other side, I think we have never been so close to putting all of this behind us because, you know, once the four power agreement comes into being, there is no problem on the planet which cannot be solved. So don't sit on the fence, become active and help us to turn this into a winning direction. OK, well, thank you, Helga, and we'll see you again next week. Yes. I hope so. See you then. <laughs>